Sir Calder Bank, of course, is very well known in uh, the area of coding, and uh, he's added over the years in many other areas where he he did pioneering work. He was also vice president for research, where at uh, AT and T, where he actually uh, founded the, the first lab for uh, massive uh, data, which everybody now is interested in massive data analysis, and. Uh, He's had several inventions uh, at the, in his career at, at Bell Labs, at and in wireless uh, uh, wireless communications, uh, magnetic uh, recording. Uh, he's an IEEE fellow and was honored at the IEEE Information uh, Theory Symposium by the Theory, the theory Prize Paper Award in 1995 and in 1999. Uh, he is a member of the National uh, Academy of Engineering uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and thank you very much for visiting. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to, um, to, to, to come here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, <coughs> I just forgot my cheat sheet. This is my... I realized I... This. Do this. All right. I think I've already thanked my sponsors. <laughs> and uh, I should actually um, really thank my uh, and, and acknowledge my collaborators. So Stephen Howard from the Defense Science and Technology Organization in Australia, Bill Moran, who's a harmonic analyst in the electrical engineering department at the University of Melbourne, and Ali Pazeshki, who was a postdoc with me at Princeton, who's now a tenure track assistant professor at Colorado State. Now, we all think about um, <coughs> Information encoding as a really old subject because it dates from 1948 and Shannon's pioneering work. Um, Hamming codes, perhaps the most famous binary codes, discovered by Hamming in 1950. Hamming codes are linear codes, so they come in pairs. There's a code and a dual code. The dual code is the first order Reed Muller code. What's perhaps less well known is that the first order Reed Muller code was actually discovered by Fisher in 1942 in the context of design of statistical experiments. And that's just one instance of a more general fact, which is that old as information theory encoding is, measurement is much older. And um, I, we're going to explore a little bit this, um, this, this development of weighing designs by Frederick Yates in particular. So you're given here a measurement device. It's got mean zero and it's got a certain variance. And you're asked to measure n objects. And you want the, uh, the, the variance of the measurement to be sigma squared over n. And the idea that was explored by Yates and by others was getting better discrimination by measuring objects in combination. And the, the, the slide at the top, the, the picture at the top is just to demonstrate the principle that there's really nothing new under the sun. Because one of the most interesting uh, uh, developments in uh, detection and estimation is compressive sensing. And the, the development of the single pixel camera by Rich Baranyuk and his group at Rice, which is really cool. And so here you have an image, and it's made to project onto an array of micro mirrors. And each of those micro mirrors, each of those pixels, can be directed towards a collector or away from a collector. So Every time you use the camera, you make a single pixel measurement. That's why it's called a single pixel camera. 
So in a sense, what you're doing here is you're measuring pixels in combination. You're doing it in space. What we're going to explore is we're going to be doing it in the frequency domain. So we're going to go back to um, Golay. So Marcel Golay, who's responsible for the, um, um, for the, for the um, discovery of the, uh, the binary Golay code, one of the most famous pages in coding and information theory. It's just a one-page paper. Um, <clears throat> and Golay was interested in far infrared spectrometry, which at the time he was active was a kind of twilight zone in between things that you could do easily optically and things that you could do easily at RF. And um, Golay, in 1949 and 1951, published two designs for spectrometers that are designed to work at room temperature. The first one involves spinning disks, which we won't talk about. The second one involves um, static slits, and that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, first of all, let me describe why it was so difficult. So what Golay was trying to do was he was trying to get information about molecules by exciting bonds. So the sources that he was looking at were really weak. And they were emitting in this region here, where there's just a huge amount of background noise. And his sensors, his detectors, were really rubbish. They were just really temperature sensors that just integrated energy over a big band. So he had weak sources, lots of noise, and lousy detectors. And, um, <clears throat> and a spectrometer is something that uses diffraction to separate different frequencies. And you collect energy by making beams pass through slits. And if you have a narrow slit, you get good frequency discrimination, but you don't collect a lot of energy. If you have wide slits, you collect enough energy, but not in a very discriminating way. Now what Golay did was that he found a way to make fat slits work. Let me describe what he did. So <clears throat> what Golay did was he took the energy from this weak source and he split it into two paths. So path one and path two. And there's a binary label on each of these two paths. And then the radiation was made to pass through pairs of input and exit masks. And on path one, you'll see that, well, first of all, you'll see the, the, the label plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus is plus, 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 minus. So it's telling you about the pattern of slits. And on the first path, the exit mask is the same as the input mask. On the second path, it's the opposite. So Golay arranged things so that the radiation that he was interested in presented orthogonal to the input mask, and the background radiation presents obliquely. And over here, I'm keeping track of the signal in the background. So the signal is the desired frequency, and the background is the, um, is the, is, is the, is the rest of the stuff. And so here, the desired radiation goes through if there's a, an input hole opposite an exit hole. And so here, I'm just collecting the amount of radiation that's coming through. The background presents at an angle, and so casts a shadow, a red shadow, of the input mask against the exit mask. And red radiation gets through if there's a common opening between the red shadow and the exit mask. And so you can see here, what I've done is I've tallied up signal and background for the two paths. And what Golay figured out was this. He says, 
because here the exit mask is the opposite of the input mask, no signal gets through. Here, signal always gets through. What he wants is for the same amount of background radiation to get through on the two paths. <clears throat> so whatever the angle of the radiation, we want the same amount of energy here as here. And the Golay complementary pairs, the x and the y, have exactly that property. Now, if you think about it for a bit, what is this, this property of equal amounts of background energy? If you, if you sit down with a pencil and paper and work it out, you'll see that it is precisely that the autocorrelation function of x plus the autocorrelation function of y is a delta function. That's what a Golay complementary pair is. And it that's the mathematical property that guarantees that this works. Um, so it's a mathematical thing. But for Golay, it was something optical. He, he really thought in optical terms about these sequences. And he thought about the sequences for about 10 years, because in 1961, he publishes a paper on complementary sequences. And he has all sorts of rules for concatenating them. And these rules um, connect to some really interesting higher mathematics that involves uh, something called the symplectic group, but that we won't talk about today. So let me give a multimedia demonstration of Golay complementary pairs. So these two sequences are Golay complementary pairs. What we're going to do is we're going to correlate this against its shifts. So we're doing the, the autocorrelation function. And so here we're just starting. We pick up a 1. And here we pick up a minus 1. And the sum of them is, um, is of course, 0. And we go across here. Now here, of course, they're on top of one another, so we get a big fat spike. And then we just, so that's Golay complementary sequences. All right. Now, <clears throat> let's change the subject a little bit. Let's talk about radar. So in radar, what we do is we ping out with a waveform. It hits something, comes back. We correlate what comes back against what's sent using match filtering. When we get a spike, that's an estimate of the round trip. So we estimate the, the range from the round trip delay. And we estimate the, the velocity, the direction and speed of travel by the, uh, the Doppler shift. Uh, if we bring the Doppler shift into, uh, into the picture here, um, <clears throat> oh, actually, we're not bringing the Doppler. Do no. So this is just here. We're, we're, we're ignoring Doppler for right now. Um, <clears throat> So we, we match the return against what we sent. And this is the sort of autocorrelation function that we're looking for. We want a big spike here. We'd like it to be narrow, because that gives us good resolution in range. And we like these range side lobes here to be really small. The reason we want them to be really small is oftentimes we ping out like, for example, at the wall at the back here. We know the wall's there. Not interested in the wall. We're interested in the stuff that's happening just in front of the wall. So if you have a strong reflector, it's going to perhaps mask interesting things that are happening close to it. So the smaller the range side lobes, the, uh, the clearer you actually see. Now here, we've, uh, we've we brought Doppler into the picture. 
Um, we are um, sending a little face-coded waveform, plus or minus one. I think that this is a Barker sequence of length 13. Um, it hits the target and comes back. It comes back with a shift in time and with a Doppler shift. Again, we do this, 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 uh, this matching against what we sent. And the, the response is called the ambiguity function. And this is a picture of the ambiguity function. This is the zero Doppler line. And this is the order correlation of the Barker sequence in black there. All right, so now what we're, what we're going to do is, um, is explore time as a degree of freedom. So what folk do in radar is they, they don't just send one sequence, they send a pulse train because they want to integrate energy over the pulse train. And so they signal then they're quiet for a while, and they signal again. And typically, the ratio of the quiet time to the signaling time is something like 100. Because that quiet time is there so that the signal can go out, hit something, and come back, and be in that blank space. And where you can think about this, this pulse train design as it brings a certain kind of modularity. Um, what we're going to do, and what all radar designers do, is you put in these pulses. Each of them has a little ambiguity function. And we'll think of the ambiguity function of the pulse train as the sum properly weighted of those individual ambiguities. So we're going to neglect correlations of this guy with that guy. That's just <coughs> standard stuff. Uh, here are some examples of, uh, of, of sequences. Uh, frank codes are basically uh, rows or columns of the, uh, the DFT. Uh, Barker codes are um, uh, there aren't so many Barker codes, but that's, that's the one of length 13, I think. And this is the, the picture for Golay complementary codes. So you can see that, um, that, that this kind of side lobe behavior is, is, really, is really ideal. There are no range side lobes. And around, shortly after Golay discovered his sequences, uh, Welty looked at these sequences, and he said, you know, these would be really useful in radar because they don't have any range side lobes. Well, 50 years later, you look around and you say, well, are there any Golay complementary sequences in radar systems? The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is that every radar engineer knows they don't work. And so I'm actually going to spend 50 minutes trying to convince you that they really do work if you do them properly. Um, but um, this is the standard text on radar by Levenon. And Levenon is being very polite. But he's basically saying that these Golay sequences, they're rubbish. They don't work. <laughs> and um, so the way that you look at this picture, this is Doppler, and that's delay. So when things aren't moving, you get this black line up the middle, which is the no range side lobes. The problem is that off of that line, you have these hot spots. And what that means is that you ping out at a stationary target, what you, at a stationary reflector, and it has a side lobe that obscures perhaps a slowly moving target that's close to it. So that's a Doppler-induced range side lobe. And the reason that Golays haven't found favor in radars is that this is a real problem. I mean, you know, you're looking for people moving in trees. 
if the trees are going to have these Doppler-induced range sound lobes, you're not going to be seeing any people. So, um, mathematically, of course, what it means is that, the, um, that, that when, you, when you add these ambiguity functions, you, you get something that uh, isn't a delta function any longer. Um, here's another picture. Um, so here I think we're looking at um, Golay complementary sequences of length 64. We've built a pulse train of 256 sequences. This is a surveillance radar that's operating, I think, around 17 gigahertz. There are three strong reflectors and two weak ones, and the weak ones are about 30 dB down. So um, it becomes difficult to see them. Now, what we would like to do is get resilience to Doppler. So we know, for example, that we're going to be looking for things that are moving at a certain speed. So we know something about the Doppler. Let's say it's close to zero. What we want to do is to build an ambiguity function that is wider than just a spike at zero and then big hot spots off of that, off of that line. How do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this guy. Let's just look at putting together two Golay pairs. Here's the ambiguity function. We'll just think of it as a Taylor series in theta. And what we're trying to do, we know it vanishes at theta equals zero. I'm sorry. So this is at the expense then of, of resolution? That um, you, you're fattening up your... Uh... Not really, no. No, we're still, we'll, we will still have the same resolution as we had before, but... Um, okay, go on. Then I, okay. The, what, the, the, what in, um, in radar, what, what happens is... Let me go back to this ambiguity function, something I should have said. Um, you would like an ambiguity function that's just a thumbtack. Right. Can't have it because of something called Moyal's identity, which is like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And what, what Moyal basically says is that you take the squared ambiguity function, there's a certain volume under that that you can't escape. So the side lobes have a certain mass. You cannot do anything about that mass. The only thing that you can do is push it somewhere that you don't want to look. And that's what radar engineers do for a living. They push side lobes places they don't want to look. So here we are. We're, we're trying to build a fatter null around zero. So we look at it as a Taylor series. Let's try and kill the, the, um, the first order in the Taylor series. And so here, there's a, there's a one, which will just come down to give you that. Here there's a two comes down to that, there there's a three, comes down to that. So, want to kill this. Well, what do we know? We know that we started off with two Golay pairs. So we know that over here, Rx2 plus Rx3 is a delta function. So, we've got twice a delta function, and then we've got an Rx3 here and an Rx1 there. Well, if x1 and x3 were also a Golay pair, then everything would be a delta function. Life would be good. And in general, you can write out the ambiguity function of this pulse train, and you can separate it into two pieces. There's sort of a main lobe piece and a range side lobe piece. And here what we're doing is we're using a binary sequence P to say whether we're transmitting X or transmitting Y. And when we write out this ambiguity function, we see this term over here. 
And the message in that term is that we can control the range side lobes by tuning the spectrum of the sequence P. So by, by, by doing the sequencing with a sequence P for which this has a certain shape, we can get a certain resilience in Doppler. Now what's the, uh, what's the sequence that does it? It's something in number theory called the tui morse sequence. It's an interesting sequence. So this is the definition. The nth term is just the sum of the binary digits of n mod 2. Here you go. You can build it up inductively. So this is the tui morse sequence of length 2. To get the tui morse sequence of length 4, you complement the sequence of length 2, and you concatenate it. To get the one of length eight, you complement the one of length four, and you concatenate it. Now, those of you who have taken coding theory might recognize that this is a first order Reed Muller code word, because that's how you build um, um, <coughs> Reed Muller code words. And you can prove a little theorem that says if you have a a tui morse sequence of length 2 to the m plus 1, it actually kills m Taylor moments. So you get, a, you, get, you get a null at 0 that rises very gradually away from 0. Now, of course, time isn't something that you can play with indefinitely, because if you're looking at something that's moving, it's not going to be in the same place. It had better be approximately in the same place when you start the pulse trade as it is when it ends. So. Uh, you, you, um, time isn't something you can. But this is a this again is the is we've seen the picture on the left before, but this is the picture. The picture on the right is where we've made the Tui Morse pulse train, and you can see that we've cleared out an interesting range in Doppler. So if you're interested in surveillance radar and you're interested in people. It's actually a very good thing to do. Um, there's more mathematics that you can do. So Tui Morse was one Reed Muller code word. You can look at other Reed Muller code words. And each Reed Muller code word is good for a certain interval. Uh, you can introduce oversampling, and then you can get simultaneous nulls at different, different places. And these are just two representative pictures. Um, <coughs> I want to say a little bit about other degrees of freedom that are available. I won't say very much about it, but I'm going to talk about polarization and talk about space. So polarization is something that is used in many remote surveillance systems. So folk can look down from outer space at your back garden and they can make up their minds whether you're growing tomatoes or something more interesting. And the way that they do that is that they transmit for a while on vertical polarization, collect statistics, collect for a while on horizontal polarization, collect statistics, and then put the two together. So one-dimensional collection complicated statistics to put them together. Now, what I want to do is something a little bit different. First of all, I want to do instantaneous polarimetry. So everything in, in my world is captured by a two by two matrix, which describes how the object scatters vertical and horizontal polarized um, radiation. And so, the, the blue waveform is what I'm going to do in vertical, and the red one is what I'm going to do in, um, in horizontal. And so here is my object. It's characterized by a scattering matrix. And this VH, so radiation came in on horizontal, and it came out on vertical, and that's the gain associated with that transition. Similarly for the rest here. Now I have to tell you how I'm going to choose the waveforms. 
and I'm actually going to choose them to be a Golay pair. And the reason that I'm going to choose them to be a Golay pair is that I'm going to make this a unitary matrix. Now here I have to tell you what wiggle is, and wiggle is conjugate time reverse. And if you think about why is this a unitary matrix, it's exactly the Golay complementary property. Now, those of you who do wireless communication will have seen this matrix before, because this is the Alamudi 2x2 two two space-time block code in its OFDM version, as in Linskog and Poiroch. Um, what's less well known uh, is this work from Seng and Liu that dates from the 1970s, because this, this matrix here is an example of something that's called a para-unitary filter bank. And they exist for all powers of two. And we don't have more than two polarizations. But you can imagine using this scheme in space. See, what you, what you do when you use it in space, and you have two to the n different locations, let's say four different locations, is each location is sending out a pulse train. And it's like a sp an orthogonal spreading sequence in, in, in CDMA. So the idea is that when you signal using a para-unitary filter bank, what in a sense you're doing is you're creating these independent channels. And wherever I am in the radar scene, I can actually tune to one of those channels. And that means that if I know approximately where the other sensors are, and our clocks are reasonably well aligned, I can actually do location. That's a very cool thing. You can actually also do location in a way that's resilient to multipath. Because what happens is, see, you have sensors, let's say, here and here. Can you use white, please? Yes. Here and here. <laughs> and you have an object here. And at a certain time, radiation comes out from the two locations. And it's then reflected. And what's reflected is a linear combination of this and this. And the linear combination identifies this point in space. It's characteristic of that point in space. Actually, if there were three, then it would be characteristic of that point in space. But that linear combination persists even when it's reflected multiple times. So how, however much multipath you have, you're still going to have that signature. That's actually a very, very cool thing. So we like para-unitary filter banks. We think that they are just the greatest. Now, <clears throat> I want to, to um, so I, I didn't talk about so much about space because I wanted to talk about frequency. So it's very tempting, in, you know, because we, there was a limit to how much time we could use. So it's really tempting, if you have enough bandwidth, to say, let's do OFDM radar. I'm just going to ping out tones, get the reflection, add them all up. There's just one problem, that when I ping out with a tone and it comes back, it comes back with a phase. And that phase depends on the range. It's basically the range mod 2 pi with respect to the frequency. And when you ping out on two different tones, the phases, when you add them, they might add destructively, like they did in this picture. So how do you get around range-dependent phases? Well, I'm going to show you how you get around range-dependent phases. Basically, the idea is we're going to have a system with a carrier. And we're actually going to transmit 
above and below carrier offset the same amount. So when we come back with a phase on one above the carrier, we'll come back with a conjugate phase below the carrier. Then we'll multiply them together and we'll do squared signal processing. And what we'll come up with is a Golay complementary sequence but with respect to squaring. Actually. So, um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll describe what it is that we're, what we're going to do, and then I'll come back and describe how we do it, right? So, I'm going to have these sequences P and Q, and they're going to have the Golay property, but with respect to the squares of their autocorrelations. And the way that I'm going to do it is um, how am I going to do it? Let me go back. <laughs> I should, do, should have done that before. <coughs> so here we have our Golay pair. This is the autocorrelation. There's one interesting fact about the autocorrelation. First of all, I mean the sum of the autocorrelations is a delta function, but at even lags, they're both identically zero. So that when I'm doing this squaring thing and adding them together to get a delta function, I only have to worry about the odd lags. And so if I actually take these sequences and multiply them by the appropriate powers of i, in the even ones, when I square, I'm, I'm just going to get 1. I'm not going to get anything. But in the odd ones, I'm going to get a 1 and a minus 1. When they add, I'll get 0. So when I take the two things and I, I multiply, my two sequences, one's obtained from the other by multiplying by this power of i. When I do the signal processing, I get the Golay complementary property, but I get it for squares of autocorrelation functions. And um, so here's the, um, um, you transmit the first sequence at carrier, you transmit the other two equally offset above and below. One of them gets multiplied by these powers of i. These are the received signals. We multiply them to, we multiply these two things together on receive, add it to that, we get a delta function. It's very cool. Now, <coughs> if, um, if you were radar engineers, you would like this picture because um, what we have here is we actually have five strong reflectors that are kind of clutter, and there's something that we're trying to see. And at the top, we have kind of the baseline, which is the best available uh, frank coded um, radar processing. And here we're seeing delay and Doppler. And here we're just looking at delay, size of the signal. And you can see here, we see our five cluttering reflectors, but we don't see the thing that we're looking for. And here we do. Actually, um, there's an interesting story here, which is that um, you know, we, we've traded in our usual linear filtering for this squared stuff. So in a sense, what we've done is we've traded side lobes for cross terms. I'm sure that there's the same amount of energy in the cross terms as there was in the side lobes. But the interesting thing about cross terms is that they're actually more volatile. What we actually do is we linearly change the offset. 
And as we linearly change the offset, we get this picture at some point. And there's a kind of meta uh, principle here, which is we don't believe in optimizing radar waveforms. Because you optimize them for one situation, you never see that situation again. But these are optimizable in the sense that there's a parameter you can tune. And if the thing you're looking for is never visible as you tune that parameter, that's very, very, very rare. The other, the other interesting thing here is that what happens is you tune the, the, um, the offset frequency is that the cross terms go all over the place. Now, when you're feeding this stuff into a tracker, it's great to have them go all over the place because the thing that confuses trackers is false tracks. And it's only real things that persist in the same place. The false guys just move all over and they look like noise. So that's a really good thing. All right, so hope to have convinced you that um, these Golay things are actually really useful. They can be used as a building block and they can be used in frequency very nicely and they can be used in space to do all sorts of cool things. So we think Lebanon is wrong and uh, <laughs> we will uh, and, and I hope that uh, the, the next time I, I, I come and give this talk we'll actually have pictures of real radars that do this. Yeah. Uh, which Doppler shifts, which range of Doppler shifts does this work for before the, the Doppler problem comes in? Well, it's the, the nice thing about Doppler is that as a degree of freedom, it's not a very big one. Mm -hmm. Because the things that you're looking for, you typically know a lot about them. They're fairly narrow range. I mean, what people do in radar systems now is they have banks of Doppler filters which basically Doppler filter in that bank is looking for Doppler in a certain range and so it predistorts the, re the receive signal and then it does regular processing for that range. Mm -hmm. that's, how they, that's how they do it. So um, basically this is something that you can tune to any, any, um, anything that you want to look for. Here we've been tuning it for, for, for stationary for, for slowly moving things, because um, my, my collaborators in Australia are interested in surveillance radars. So um, we, we're, we're actually looking to, um, they, like us, have a budget crisis right now. And the way the Australian government is saving money is it's not, a, it's, it's not allowing DSTO to fire anyone, but it's also not allowing them any money for expense, <laughs> right? That's, that's so, <laughs> <laughs> so you've got, I don't know how many thousand highly trained people just sitting on their bottoms, not able to go out and make radar measurements. <laughs> how useful is that? I don't know. But anyway, uh, one of the things, one of the points that I want to make actually about, about this stuff is that um, some of the, the, actually some of the most interesting applications don't actually have anything to do with military. So, um, weather radar, right? There's a network of weather radars in the US. They're spaced quite far apart. Because of the curvature of the Earth, that means you only have visibility above like 10,000 feet. Now, if you're worried about things like tornadoes, they happen below 10,000 feet. And so NSF right now is putting together a little network of radars that can refine the pictures that you see on your TV screen so that you'll be able to detect things like tornadoes with more certainty and sooner. So that's, I mean, that's a really cool application. And we expect, unfortunately, to see a lot more need for it as the planet warms. 
The other things that um, radars can be used for are wildfires, where it's really, it's really important to know which way the wind's blowing. One of the interesting things about, you know, how do you track wind? Well, you, one of the ways you do it is reflection off of insects. <laughs> there's, if you go into the literature on, 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 on radar, there's all sorts of really arcane and interesting papers about reflectivity of different kinds of insects. <laughs> it's, very, it's very cool. Um, okay. Let me... So that's the second part of the talk. So there's three themes. I want to give you some idea of where the mathematics comes from in Gole complementary sequences. And it turns out that the mathematical framework is exactly the same framework as for quantum error correction. And so here, we start with the symmetry group of the square. We can also think of it as the, as, as the, the error group associated with a single qubit. So a single quantum bit is a two-dimensional Hilbert space. It could be a particle. It could be spin up, spin down. Those are the two states. The matrix X is flipping 0 and 1. The matrix Z is a phase shift. Uh, if we want to think in terms of the symmetry group of the square, Z is just reflection in the horizontal axis, and XZ is anticlockwise rotation by pi by 2. Uh, so the symmetry group of the, the square is the dihedral group D4. It's just eight 2 by 2 matrices. Every one of them can be written in this form. The important thing about X and Z is they anti-commute. That is to say, X times Z is equal to minus Z times X. Now, if you have m qubits, then the error group is Kronecker products of these little 2 by 2 matrices. And um, if you ask yourself how many such products are there, well, there are 2 to the 2m plus 2. So the, the plus 2 are the different scalars. They're the, t they're the powers of i. And then there's m degrees of freedom in this binary vector A that tells you where the x's are. And there's m degrees of freedom in the vector B that tells you where the z's are. So everything in this group is indexed by a, an A vector and a B vector. And it's a calculation. Just goes back to the previous slide. Any two of these things, they either commute or they anti-commute. And you can figure out which just by this symplectic form. So this is A prime in a product B plus B prime in a product A. Everything squares to either plus or minus the identity. Here are two examples. So. Ah. <coughs> okay. So now. The, the main point in this last bit of the talk is that coding theory and Fourier analysis are really just the same thing. Okay? So the right-hand side is discrete Fourier analysis. Okay? So you're, you're working modulo n. n is 2 to the m. And the delta k zeros, they are time shifts by k. Delta zero j's are the corresponding frequency shifts. So this is a group. That's a group. They're interchanged by the Fourier transform. And if you remember your Fourier analysis, you know that sinusoids are eigenfunctions of time shifts. right? Now, the same picture happens in the binary world. So in the binary world, I have these DA zeros. Those are going to be my binary time shifts. Of course, it's a bit funny because we have these coordinate positions. They're indexed by binary vectors x. And my time shift is adding a to x, that permutation. Still, I'll think of it as a time shift. The D0B matrix, these are all diagonal matrices 
corresponding to the, uh, the characters of this group. And they're my phase shifts. These are interchanged by the walsh hadamard matrix. It's just a calculation. And so what are the sinusoids in the binary world? They're actually Walsh functions. So again, a calculation to show that Walsh functions are eigenvectors of this group. So Walsh functions are in the binary world to what sinusoids are in the Fourier world. And this correspondence between binary world and Fourier world goes further. Because, you know, in the Fourier world, you have chirps. What are chirps in the binary world? They're actually second-order Reed-Muller code words. Makes some kind of sense, right? Because second order is quadratic. Chirps are quadratic. So <laughs> a priori, it could happen. Um, there's this kind of picture. So you have a group here. This is the time shift group. These are the Walsh functions. They're the rows or the columns of the walsh hadamard matrix. And these are eigenfunctions for that group. Um, if, if I conjugate this group by, well, if I can find a transformation that preserves that error group by conjugation, it's going to move around the commutative subgroups inside of that group. Now, we're not going to go into the structure in any detail, but the, the group in question above the heisenberg weil group is called the symplectic group. This is an element of that group. And here, P is a binary symmetric matrix. It's diagonal. This, this DP is diagonal. This is the Vth diagonal entry. And it's a little bit complicated because though this is binary, this arithmetic takes place modulo 4. Um, but this is a transformation that normalizes the heisenberg weil group. And so it takes this commutative subgroup to another commutative subgroup. Post-multiplying by dp takes the eigenfunctions here to eigenfunctions of the new group. And if you know a little coding theory, then you will start to recognize that these eigenfunctions here are actually code words in the second order Reed-Muller code. And so we don't usually think of the second order Reed-Muller code, code in this way, but it's a union of cosets of the first order Reed-Muller code. Every one of those cosets is like an orthonormal basis for um, complex space. And you could make an analog of this picture in the Fourier domain with respect to the fractional Fourier transform and things like that. So um, I have to tell you <laughs> very briefly where, where these, these things come from. Um, we're going to pretend that we're physicists, so we're going to reduce everything to operators. Um, and, um, and so we're going to look at this 2 to the m dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, we're going to look at the trace in a product. And we're going to observe that these matrices that we put together before, they're actually an orthonormal basis for that space of operators with respect to the trace in a product. And standard stuff in harmonic analysis, you can take any operator and write it as a linear combination of these things, just as you always do in linear algebra. Uh, this thing is called the Weyl transform. And so we're going to represent operators by just an array indexed by A and B of the coefficients in this expansion. Now, let me build up a little intuition for you about operators or particular operators. 
So I'm going to be interested in rank one projection operators. So this is an operator I get from just putting a sequence together with its transpose. So here we are. I've taken a Walsh sequence. Remember that Walsh sequences are eigenfunctions of the DA0 group. So I build my operator. Here it is. And I express it in terms of the DABs. And I observe that the only things that happen there are A0. So the only things that appear here are things in the symmetry group. Is that a coincidence? Well, no, because if I do it for just this Dirac function, I build this rank one operator, I express it as a linear combination. Oh, the only things that appear there are the D0Bs. They were the symmetry group. You know, these spikes have diagonal symmetry groups. So, so here, you start with a sequence, has a certain symmetry group, you build a rank one projector, you think about its while transform. We have just proved by example that it's supported on the perp of the symmetry group. So that's expressed in 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 uh, in in in, uh, <coughs> in in this theorem here. Um, and one of the interesting things we can do is we can take the Fourier domain and write it in the other basis. So for example, we can take the, um, the time shifts in the real Fourier domain, and we can ask what their support looks like in my funny D binary world. Turns out to have a very pretty answer. They're just Sapinski triangles. So something's black in the Sapinski triangle if the Y coordinate is contained in the X coordinate. Contained means think of a binary vector as a set, then it's containment of sets. All right. Now, how is this going to help us? Well, we're going to take the, um, we're not going to worry, I, I'm going to just sweep under the rug this going from cyclic things to padding with zeros. This is the Golay complementary property. You have two sequences, theta and phi. You shift them by k, correlate with themselves, sum them up. You get 0 unless k equals 0. All right? Linear algebra, we'll just rewrite that in this form. So we're, we've done the physicist thing. We've reduced our linear algebra equation to an equation involving operators and the trace in a product. And now we're saying, well, how can I build these critters so that that's true? And the way that we go about it is we say, we're going to think in this AB domain. We know what the support of these guys looks like. We're going to try and build something over here that's orthogonal to it. Well, a good way of being orthogonal is if your supports are disjoint. So we'll actually try and choose things over here to have disjoint support. How are we going to do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use this fact that the, um, oh, let's go forward, that the, um, um, I have a commutative subgroup. I have these eigenvectors. I build rank one projectors. Every one of those rank one projectors, the while transforms just supported on the group. So I'm going to choose theta and phi to be two different eigenvectors in the same orthonormal basis. Now I choose the orthonormal basis, I choose the symmetry group so that it has minimal intersection with the Sapinski triangle. So here the red and the purple points are the commutative group. The intersection between the commutative group and the Sapinski triangle are the purple points. There's only three of them. And so now I have to choose the pair. And actually, it's not too hard to choose the pair, because 
you choose the any two things in my symmetry group are actually connected by 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 a um, um, by by one of the things in the group, and I choose the I choose the pairing, so that when I look at the rank one projection of these two rank one projection operators and their wild transform, whatever coefficient this one has here, the other one has the negative. So, by choosing the symmetry group, I didn't I didn't have to worry about too many purple points. There's a last step where I choose the pairing inside the orthonormal basis to make them have equal but opposite signs. And that's where they, um, that's where they all come from. Um, where are these, what are these blue things? Well, the blue things are the even lags. Remember these Gole complementary sequences? They vanished at even lags. Geometrically, that corresponds to there being no intersection between the red and the purple points and the blue points. You just see that geometrically. Anyway, <laughs> go back to just radar to, to, to wrap up. Um, Woodward, in 1953, actually introduced this narrowband radar ambiguity function. And He has this tremendously self-depreciating comment at the end of the book, which is, did all this stuff, but you know, we still don't know what to transmit. And I think he was being really unfair to himself. Uh, but I think today we know a little bit more about what to transmit. The other thought that I'd like to leave you with is that classical coding theory, and what could be more classical than first and second order read Muller codes, it's just Fourier analysis, disguised. Actually, I mean, there are a lot of books on coding theory, and I have a special fondness for books that have a point of view. So the Dick Blayhut book has a point of view, which is more or less exactly that. And I kind of like that. All right. Thanks for your attention. We have time for a few questions. I have a question. Yeah. Um, Rob, when you were talking about the Paramudi code. Ryan, can you speak into for these? Oh, the the I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Okay. 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 When, when you were talking about the Paramudi codes, you were dealing with a system where you had the ability to send and receive two different measurements yes. uh, simultaneously. Um, and the, the scheme that you used to deal with that was was basically a two by two orthogonal block design. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you had a system that had the ability to, to send more than two different measurements, would orthogonal block designs play a role in something analogous? Yeah. So these these so the question is uh, when we were doing um, instantaneous radar polarimetry, we basically had a two by two block design. Uh, in this case a two by two block design was essentially the Alamudi block space time code. And Brian's asking, what about bigger designs? And the, the, so the, the answer is, when you're looking at space, the rows and columns of your design correspond to different locations. Um, the, you're still very much interested in this orthogonality uh, condition. Because in radar, you can always write down the equations. And you can always sort of solve them in principle. But just like in wireless communication, what's important is to minimize the signal processing complexity. And when you make these block designs and they have the orthogonality property, then you can basically, just with linear processing, you can just, folk, you can just tune to one of those and eliminate the others. And that's exactly, that's exactly what they do and why they're really useful. So, uh, um, Any other questions? I have a question. Actually, I remember a, a paper, an old paper by Jack Wolf, like yep. in uh, IEEE Proceedings or something. I think it was in the 80s or mm -hmm. early 90s or something. 
where he was making this connection about coding and Fourier uh, analysis and, uh, and, and now, Shortly thereafter, there, there has been, you know, with the advent of wavelets and all that, people sort of jumped on the bandwagon mm -hmm. trying to kind of connect uh, uh, how, do you, how do you construct code using wavelets uh, and things of that nature. It still sort of escapes me as to, from a signal processing viewpoint, uh, I, I, still, I still, let me put it this way, what is the easiest way to make the connection? The, uh, the uh, if I wanted to cross the bridge, uh, because I'm no coding theorist, so I, I don't know a lot of these. Uh, so, what's the easiest way to uh, to cross the bridge between the two? Well, I I think that that Blayhut's book is actually pretty good. I mean, Blayhut Blayhut's book says you're an electrical engineer, you understand convolution, you understand how it works. Codes are just like this. Let me show you. So he does that. There is a. B I don't know whether this is the paper of Wolf that you're that you're thinking there about. There was an IEEE proceeding. No. So this is much earlier. So Wolf has a paper in something, and maybe even in the late '60s, which is another one of the. There's nothing new under the sun papers, um, where he looks at Reed Solomon decoding. And he says, you know. This was actually done in 1795 by De Prony. It may be that one, then, yeah. Yeah, so it's, you know, because De Prony is looking at interpolation, he's doing it over um, the complex field. Right. Um, but it's a very good observation. Um, and, um, you know, and that's also got a, it's also had a, a, a modern flowering in that people have thought about using Deproni for compressive sensing. Um, the only problem with that is the instability. I mean, the, the relationship between the roots of a polynomial and its coefficients mm -hmm. is highly unstable. And so it's not, that's not a very good way, I think, of doing compressive sensing. Another question. Since the calculations here are over the real or the complex field, has there been any consideration of, of possible complex extensions, non-binary extensions? So the, um, let me go back here. What we've done, what we've been doing here is we've been actually going back rather freely back and forth between the binary and the mod 4 representations of reed muller codes. Um, the, there is a beautiful correspondence between geometry in the binary world and geometry in the real and complex world. So um, the story is that each binary symmetric matrix P gives you an orthonormal basis, actually corresponding to a coset of first order Reed Muller and second order Reed Muller. Now you can take two such bases corresponding to matrices P and Q, and you can take a vector in one basis and a vector in the other, and you can ask what their inner product is. So how coherent are the two bases? The answer depends on the binary rank of P plus Q. If P plus Q is non-singular, then the two bases are unbiased. So there's a lovely correspondence between binary geometry involving symmetric matrices, alternating forms, and mutually unbiased bases, frames in signal processing that are unions of bases. It's very, very pretty. And, and you, you go back and forth between the binary and the characteristic zero world all the time. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker.